I'm going to ask you this evening to turn to John chapter 5 and we're going to look especially at words spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ there in verse 17 where he says in answer to the thoughts in the words of the Jews my father worketh hitherto and I work the enmity amongst the Jews in the days of Jesus was becoming very very evident they were looking to put him to death and repeatedly trying to lay traps for him that they might accuse him of blasphemy or of law breaking in one kind or another and of course this is the most preposterous of all things because who is Jesus but God in the flesh the law giver and the one most perfectly qualified to know what the law actually meant now the definition of the law according to Christ was very different from the law definition gave by the scribes and the Pharisees all they did was to embellish certain things that they found in the law of Moses and probably in some cases they didn't find in the law of Moses and and supplement them and embellish them and add to them so that what you ended up with was almost unrecognisable compared to what you begin with in the word of God and yet they accuse him of breaking the law and doing that which was wrong in God's eyes well there are two things that the Jews here um, become upset about so to speak the first thing is what the Lord did with this man at the pool of Bethesda this man who'd been a cripple unable to move for 38 years who had no one to put him into the pool and he was helpless and Jesus says unto him in verse 8 rise take up thy bed and walk and immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked and on the same day was the Sabbath now that last clause in the verse there is a kind of ominous tone isn't there it's a kind of an announcement that there's going to be trouble and there was and it's described in verse 10 here are the Jews in enmity against Christ the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured it is the Sabbath day it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed he answered them he that made me whole the same said unto me take up thy bed and walk who is the one who told him to take up the bed and walk the lawgiver, the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath. Take up thy bed and walk. But there they are saying, it is not lawful for thee to take up thy bed and walk. And so it goes on, and we read in verse 16, Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Christ, in their view, had had the audacity to work and to heal a man, on the Sabbath day and then to command him to do something that they reckoned was unlawful to do and they were out to put him to death his answer to that is stated in verse 17 our verse this evening my father worketh hitherto and I work well here's a second issue that they take up against him Verse 18 says, Therefore, because of his words in verse 17, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Now it's quite striking, isn't it, to note there that the Jews understood perfectly what Jesus meant by those words. Now there are those today, of course, that um, claim that uh, the scriptures never make any assertion that Jesus is the Son of God or that there is a Son of God uncreated and fully equal with God and there are people about different cults and ideas of things that, that claim such things, that Jesus is a created being. That's not new, it goes back for centuries but it manifests itself in different ways. <clears throat> 
But those who were inveterate set enemies of Jesus knew exactly what he meant and they admitted it. They admitted what he said. They didn't agree with him, they didn't accept it, but they knew exactly what he was claiming. He was claiming relationship to God in a special way. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. They understand that he's claiming that unique relationship with his father, the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. Scripture teaches as well, we know, that they are equal and fully God. Each person being one God. So he's claiming relationship there. He's claiming equality there. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. And the implication there is that just as his father has been working, so the son has been working. And that implies, of course, that they are both together engaged in the one work. It implies very clearly, and this is important, that they have the one purpose and that they have the one will. They are not two individuals that are separate from each other. In that sense, they are both fully God with the one purpose and with the one will. And the Jews seem to grasp what the Lord Jesus is saying here and claiming for himself. Well, all of this truth, of course, is demonstrated elsewhere in the scripture and nowhere more clearly in the account of the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we've seen this lately, but let me remind you, God is that word in the Hebrew, Elohim. It's a plural word. It alludes, it alludes straight away, the very opening words of the Bible, that there is a trinity in God. It doesn't expressly say trinity, but it, it's telling us, isn't it, right from the beginning, that there is one God, but that one God is in more than one person. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, says God in Genesis 1 and verse 26. So there's the Father and the Son and also the Holy Spirit. Now is Christ the Son of God? Is he the one responsible for creation? Well, in Colossians 1 and verse 26, the Apostle Paul plainly says this. He plainly says that Christ is God. By him, that's Christ, the Son of God, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. So you put that together with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and so forth. And Colossians 1.26, all things were, that are, he, by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. That immediately puts the Son of God, Christ, back into Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. The Jews understood enough to think that Jesus was claiming to be equal with God. And this riles them all the more and their determination to persecute the Lord Jesus Christ and to put him to death becomes even stronger. He's guilty in one day of two great sins in their view. Well, I say all that by way of introduction because what the Lord says here is a most wonderful statement. Verse 17, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. It points us to this glorious fact that God is always at work. God is always active. God ceaselessly is working to fulfill his glorious purposes. Psalm 104 and verse 24 declares, O Lord, how manifold are thy works, how many in kind, how many in number. The psalmist says in Psalm 107, O oh, that men would praise the Lord, and goes on to speak about the wondrous works of God toward the sons of men. The works of God, the works that God performs 
in the history of this world. And they are many, and they're so various, and we can't begin to explore all of them. But I just want to remind you of things I'm sure that you already know, and to apply that in some way to our own lives and our own situations. The working God, the performing God, as sometimes it's been put. And he works in the realm of what we call nature, upholding the universe that he first created. Hebrews 1.3 speaks about the Lord upholding all things by the word of his power. He upholds its very existence. It's a work that God is always undertaking and performing, otherwise the world would cease to be, the universe would, would not exist anymore. I know I've said this a lot of times, but we mustn't imagine that God has created something that then becomes outside of his control. If he wills for it to cease to be, it will cease to be. If he wills and works for it to cease to continue, it will continue. It is all dependent upon the work of God. Its very existence is dependent upon God's word of power, his work. So, in the realm of nature, God works to maintain the very existence of creation, and God works to maintain the order of creation. In other words, the way that everything works together to sustain life. Remember the promise after the flood, Genesis 8.22, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat, and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease, while the earth remaineth, it shall remain for so ever long as God determines, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Why? Because God has set something in motion that can't be overturned? No, because God upholds the working out of nature. As Jesus taught in Matthew 5.45, He maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Notice the words, He maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He does that. He makes it work like that and sendeth the rain on the just and on the unjust. If he didn't send the rain, there wouldn't be any rain. If he didn't cause the sun to shine, there wouldn't be any sunshine. So it's the work of God to sustain the order of, 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 of the natural world. It works because God works. Now, in man's arrogance, of course, Man has replaced the concept of stewardship with the proud presumption of lordship. In other words, man now talks in terms of the fact that we can control this world. Its future is in our hands. It's all up to us as to how the world is, how, how it can be sustained, how it can remain healthy, how it can continue uh, indefinitely. For the, for the future. It's all in the hands of men. Well, it's not. We're stewards, and we're meant to be good and wise stewards of it, but we're not controllers of it. Stewards, not lords. Whereas the world says, we're lords, we're not just stewards, because stewardship, of course, implies that there is a God to, give, to whom we have to give an account. But God works in the realm of nature. It's God's world he created it, he sustains it, and he's working ceaselessly to uphold that which he has made for his own pleasure, his own honour, and his own glory. And then secondly, God, of course, is always at work in the affairs of nations. The word of God makes this very plain. I just give you two instances. Psalm 103 and verse 19 the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. What's the idea of preparing a throne? A throne is where rule and reign and sovereignty is exercised from. And God has set his, or prepared his throne in the heavens. It's above the world. And yet God 
God's kingdom rules over all. The whole universe is all under God's sovereign rule. Or you might like to think of Psalm 22 and verse 28. The kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. Now you think of these great organisations that men have um, thought of and, and introduced. You have the United Nations set up ostensibly to preserve peace. You have things like the European Union and so forth that brings, again ostensibly, people together to, to make things work well, as though men have the answer. That's always the message that comes through. We have the answer, we can rule things, we can determine things for the future. But what does the scripture say? God is the governor among the nations. To rule, that's the word used in Psalm 103, his kingdom ruleth over all. And the word used in Psalm 23, uh, 28, the term governor, both obviously and strongly imply activity. You don't rule by turning your back upon something. You don't act as a governor by abdicating from your throne. God is actively engaged in ruling and in governing. And it's he that raises empires and rulers and then brings them down again. We've quickly forgotten, haven't we, how the Soviet Union, that seemingly impregnable fortress of of, uh, of, of a, a union that was established by sheer force crumbled so quickly and so completely. God brings things up and God brings things down. We've looked recently, haven't we, at the book of Ezra. You remember Cyrus, the Persian emperor who was... Uh, predicted a hundred years or so beforehand through the words of the prophet Isaiah, the Lord that saith of Cyrus, this unknown, unheard of, at that stage unborn ruler of, emperor, of an emperor, an empire that wasn't even the predominant empire of the world. He saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. God governing to the intent of accomplishing his own purposes. Now, we listen to the news, or we watch the news on the television, or we might even yet still buy a newspaper, and we notice what's happening in the world and what's reported nationally and internationally, and we hear about all of these things. And we have reported to us, and we can observe, the causes of changes, where a government falls because the leader makes an error of some sort. And we observe the, the international shift of power. It was all America at one point, wasn't it? The superpower. Well, it still is to a large degree. But then what you have happening over in the East is the rise of China. And even India to an extent. And so on and so forth. Well, we see all of this and we can explain it in terms of military power or economic strength. But what we're looking at there are second causes. There's a first cause. There's one who's above and beyond it, organising things, orchestrating things, bringing economic prosperity over there, denying it over there, empowering a nation to be powerful military, militarily and so forth over there and then becoming economically poor just as we have in our own country the empire what happened to that britain rules the seas what happened to that it's all gone isn't it and you can explain it in terms of second causes but the ultimate cause is the rule of god he is the governor among the nations and the point to observe here, my father worketh hitherto and I work, God is actively and actually governing the nations. It's a mystery. You can't see why. We can't see what's happening in the future. But God is always in control and working these things out and doing so wisely and for his own glory and for his own praise in the end. <clears throat> 
So the Lord works to maintain his creation, he works to govern in the affairs of nations, and he works thirdly in the life of his church, working and operating to bring a people to himself. <clears throat> the Old Testament record, finally, is a record first of promise and then of divine activity. Divine promise and divine activity. God says early on, the, the earliest uh, gospel message in the Bible concerns the raising of the son of the woman who would bruise the head of the serpent. That's a, 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 a a kind of a, a rather a mysterious, I, I grant you, but a mysterious promise that the Redeemer would come and put down the enemy of God and his people. There's a promise and that promise is amplified and explained as years unfold. But what you find as a result of that and following on from that is a whole history of divine activity. God has spoken a word, he has promised a redeemer, and from that moment on, you got through the, the history of, of Abraham and, and the, the fathers Isaac and Jacob and the, and, and the people of Israel. You've got God working in order to bring about the fulfillment of his promise. Preserving the Jewish nation, preserving the line of David, until that moment came when God sent forth his son, born of Mary. God worked to bring all this about. God worked to prepare for that day, for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, the words of the Lord that we so much like to think about and to take comfort in, in the days such as we're living in, I will build my church. My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. The Son and the Father working in tandem with the one will, with the one purpose, all the way from the beginning. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes into the world and makes this most emphatic and strong statement, I will build my church. And that is applied in, we can think of that in three things, in three ways. First of all, I will build my church numerically. I will add to my church. There will be people converted, sometimes in great numbers all at once, more often in ones and twos, sometimes in dramatic fashion, sometimes and more often perhaps quietly. I will build my church numerically. I will bring in the Lord's people, gathering them together, as the universal and invisible church and gathering them together and putting them down in local churches such as this one. I will build my church numerically, but it has further application. I will build my church spiritually, in depth and in strength. And he does that. He's working in these things, working to convert people and bring them in by one means or another, and then working to build up his people, build his church spiritually, instructing through his word, changing by his spirit and preparing them for glory. God is at work in all of these ways, in and through his church. So I will build my church numerically and I will build my church spiritually and we can put on the end of that, I will build my church completely. And finally, all of the elect of God will come in. They will come in. All that the Father giveth unto me shall come unto me. And the whole church will come in by the end. And then in glory the whole church will be completely transformed into perfect holiness. And God is at work to perform his good will and pleasure. My Father worketh hitherto and I work and with that great aim and that great purpose in view. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? As you look around and you hear what's going on, you see behind the scenes an unseen God, but he's active all the time, upholding his creation, governing the nations, 
working in the life of his church to accomplish his gracious purposes. Let me just finish by applying this in a personal way, fourthly. Hitherto my Father worketh, and I work in the personal lives of his people, always at work in us and for us. And that's why Paul can so confidently and comfortingly say in Romans 8.28, surely one of the most widely quoted verses in all of Scripture, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. And why do all things work together for good? Because God is at work. They don't inevitably happen of their own, of their own volition, as it were. It's not a series of accidents or coincidences that all things work together. And we can look back and say, well, I'm glad that happened because look what the result might be. It's not like that. All things are working together, in other words, cooperating together, because God is working behind all things to make all things work together for good. It's all down to his doing. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we can take that to our own hearts and to our own states and circumstances. God has a most definite purpose and plan for every one of his people in this world. It's what I like to call a general purpose and a particular purpose. In other words, the general purpose, I mean by that, the general purpose is that we should live wholly unto God. Now that, that's a general rule that applies to everybody. But there are particular purposes. For one purpose, for one person, it may be that they are, they are saved in, in the course of their lives and they, they are engaged in some profession and it's God's particular purpose that in that place and at that time and in that way they should bear a testimony to, to his gospel among that people. To another man, it may be his purpose, as it sometimes is, we pray to God it might be his purpose more often, that he might call a man out of that workaday world, that he might be the servant of God in, in pastoral office, for example. But God has different purposes for different people. You might think of someone who is adept at teaching, and that would work well in the secular world, but there's a work to do for God in the spiritual world. There might be someone that's very good, and don't misunderstand me when I put it like this, but they might be very good at polishing and cleaning. And that kind of gift can be applied in the life of the local church. There's a purpose, there's a particular purpose that God has for us in our lives. He may, his will may be for some person to get married very early, it may be another pur will, uh, purpose for another person to get married comparatively late. It may even be the will and the purpose of God for a person not to be married at all. But it's God's purpose that is designed and applied for every individual. He has a purpose and he has a will. And all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. He has prepared that purpose lovingly and graciously and wisely. We could never doubt that. We may not understand things at times and we may wriggle and squirm against the workings of God. But God's purposes are always right and, and planned in love and, and administered in grace and with wisdom. So there's the plan and there's the purpose that is prepared and he works to accomplish it. He works to accomplish it. I may have a, a great design for some engineering project, most unlikely, but I might have some great design and I've got through all the detail. And then having written all the plans down and, and all the designs and everything most carefully, I take the paperwork or the computer program and lock it away in a drawer somewhere and forget all about it. Well, it's buried, it's gone, it's of no use. 
And it would be of no use for God to have a plan and a purpose unless he brought that plan and that purpose to bear and to work. And this is precisely what the Lord does. He works to accomplish his purposes for every one of his people. He does so, so carefully. Carefully. Attention to every detail. I was watching a program on the television the other day about the restoration of an old wartime aircraft, not a fighter, not a bomber, but an old transport plane. And someone over here in England had bought this wreck of a plane from America, and it was a wreck. There were no engines, and there was corrosion here, and rust over there, and it was just a wreck. And the idea was to try and get this thing in operational condition, in readiness for the 75th anniversary of the landings on D-Day, because from this very kind of aeroplane, thousands of paratroopers were dropped over Normandy on, on D-Day. And they showed this program about uh, the work that was done on this aeroplane, and it was unbelievable. The detail that they, they went into, the, 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 the bolts and the rivets, and, and, and the painting of these things before they were assembled. And, and the detail was just astonishing. The hours and hours and hours that were put into that was quite colossal. In the end, they couldn't get it finished in time, predictably. These works are always more than we, we, we realise is going to be involved. But this is the picture of God, isn't it? The detail. A work over here, a work over there, a bringing together of one person to another and behind it all is the hand of God moving and directing and providing and manoeuvring things and events and people that they might come together to, prov to ensure that his work is accomplished. Attention to every detail. He works also patiently, patiently, bearing with us because we're so very slow to appreciate the works of God. So often filled with unbelief, so willful, so wanting to take things into our own hands, so foolish, so stubborn, and yet the Lord is so patient in his dealings with us and in his works on our behalf. And he works actually in providence. He's always at work always at work, ceaselessly. He's at work undetectably at times, and we can't see it. We have an issue that's upon our hearts and minds, and we bring it to God in prayer, and what do we see happening? We don't see anything happening. But does that mean to say that God is not at work? Who can tell? Who can tell what God is doing at any particular moment? As he works things together, that suddenly, from out of nowhere, comes an answer to that prayer. Who can tell what God does unseen to us? So he works to accomplish his purposes. And as that text in Romans 8 says, it's always for good. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose for our own personal good. That's the main meaning there. For our spiritual good. That's the main thing. We mustn't be materialistically minded or we want God to work this that we might be richer or more comfortable or anything of that kind. Good, by definition, is really spiritual good. And what God does to work is to that end, our spiritual good, our holiness, our faith, our love for the Lord. But having said that, of course, he does work in material ways. He provides whatever he deems right for us, whatever might be in harmony with his purpose for our spiritual good, he'll provide that. He works through our experiences, all geared to our spiritual improvement and our spiritual strength. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose.
for our good, for the good of the church, and for the good of God's own honour and God's own glory. So here's the thrust of the message, really. Our God is a working God, an active God, a God who is always, Sabbath or not Sabbath, working to uphold his creation, governing the affairs of nations, building up his church, and working in the lives of his people to our good. And so we have that refrain in Psalm 107, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Do we have an appreciation of what God has already done? Do we have an insight into what God may be doing now, even beyond our knowledge? And shouldn't we have a faith in God that in the days to come, he will work in all these ways, sustaining his creation, governing the nations, ruling in the life of his church, and undertaking and working in the lives of his people. That is our God, ceaselessly working to the good of his people. Well, praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Amen.